So, continuing our series of lectures on modernism, we now turn to architecture and, in particular, to the work of Frank O'Gary. Now, I'm not going to go into his career in detail, it is enough to say that early on he was, like other modernist architects, tied to the rectangle, the straight line, and so on. Often their buildings would have this basic shape and they would just add bits of decoration like splashes of color or pointless balconies. Soon enough, Gary wanted to break away from straight lines and gridline designs. He wanted the freedom to experiment with other shapes curves and unusually angled roofs. What helped him with this was the computer, which allowed him to visualize and experiment with complex shapes, and to work on the whole design as one piece, without the added decoration being thrown in as an afterthought. Architecture as art, if you like, or, or sculpture even. He himself said that he had struggled with crossing the line between architecture and sculpture. Now, I want to talk about one building in particular, the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao, which I think you'll agree is a masterpiece. So, continuing our series of lectures on modernism, we now turn to architecture and, in particular, to the work of Frank O'Gary. Now, I'm not going to go into his career in detail, it is enough to say that early on he was, like other modernist architects, tied to the rectangle, the straight line, and so on. Often their buildings would have this basic shape and they would just add bits of decoration like splashes of color or pointless balconies. Soon enough, Gary wanted to break away from straight lines and gridline designs. He wanted the freedom to experiment with other shapes curves and unusually angled roofs. What helped him with this was the computer, which allowed him to visualize and experiment with complex shapes, and to work on the whole design as one piece, without the added decoration being thrown in as an afterthought. Architecture as art, if you like, or, or sculpture even. He himself said that he had struggled with crossing the line between architecture and sculpture. Now, I want to talk about one building in particular, the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao, which I think you'll agree is a masterpiece. I'd want to tell you a little bit about the workbook we'll be using before we begin our first experiment. The first point I'd like to make is that the worksheet contains a substantial quantity of information. Far more than a single semester could possibly contain. What you're expected to do is pick and select the experiments and activities you wish to conduct within a set of guidelines. It's part of my duty to assist you in making decisions. Following that, I'd like to point out that each workbook chapter normally has two subsections. The first is referred to as experiments, whereas the second is referred to as activities. The workbook includes comprehensive instructions for all of the experiments in the experiment section, giving alternate techniques to the procedure you choose. There is a lot of equipment to choose from. You'll discover options for tasks to perform on your own time in the activities area. You'll notice that the activities frequently don't come with thorough instructions. You are expected to do them in your own style. Let's go on to chapter 1 if there are no more questions. I'd want to tell you a little bit about the workbook we'll be using before we begin our first experiment. The first point I'd like to make is that the worksheet contains a substantial quantity of information. Far more than a single semester could possibly contain. 
What you're expected to do is pick and select the experiments and activities you wish to conduct within a set of guidelines. It's part of my duty to assist you in making decisions. Following that, I'd like to point out that each workbook chapter normally has two subsections. The first is referred to as experiments, whereas the second is referred to as activities. The workbook includes comprehensive instructions for all of the experiments in the experiment section, giving alternate techniques to the procedure you choose. There is a lot of equipment to choose from. You'll discover options for tasks to perform on your own time in the activities area. You'll notice that the activities frequently don't come with thorough instructions. You are expected to do them in your own style. Let's go on to chapter 1 if there are no more questions. Before you toss away an old phone, think about what you can do with it. Donating it to a charity for reuse, taking it to an e-waste disposal center, or finding a firm that refurbishes obsolete models are all viable options for reducing waste. We must also keep an eye out for recycling firms. Dismantling cell phones comes with the same social and environmental issues that come with making them. Exporting electronic garbage to nations where labor costs are low but working conditions are squalid is occasionally done on purpose. The neural systems of workers, many of whom are women and children, may be permanently damaged by lead and mercury exposure if they are not properly paid, trained, or protected from exposure. Toxic chemicals can be leached into the soil and water from large dump sites where cell phone garbage is dumped, an issue that mirrors that of the mines where the elements were first discovered. A phone is more than what it appears to be at first glance. It's a mashup of components from several countries with global ramifications in progress. In the meanwhile, we'll have to come to grips with how new technology affects a wide range of locations and individuals. Before you toss away an old phone, think about what you can do with it. Donating it to a charity for reuse, taking it to an e-waste disposal center, or finding a firm that refurbishes obsolete models are all viable options for reducing waste. We must also keep an eye out for recycling firms. Dismantling cell phones comes with the same social and environmental issues that come with making them. Exporting electronic garbage to nations where labor costs are low but working conditions are squalid is occasionally done on purpose. The neural systems of workers, many of whom are women and children, may be permanently damaged by lead and mercury exposure if they are not properly paid, trained, or protected from exposure. Toxic chemicals can be leached into the soil and water from large dump sites where cell phone garbage is dumped, an issue that mirrors that of the mines where the elements were first discovered. A phone is more than what it appears to be at first glance. It's a mashup of components from several countries with global ramifications in progress. In the meanwhile, we'll have to come to grips with how new technology affects a wide range of locations and individuals. I'm Steve Pinker, and I'm a Harvard College professor and Johnston family professor in the psychology department. The Harvard Cognitive Revolution marked the beginning of contemporary scientific study of the mind. You can't see them, you can't taste them, and you can't feel them if you study something like the mind. If you pretend to be a scientist, you'll be confronted with the immediate problem of what we do with these things called mental contents, thoughts, emotions, images, plans, and rules, which you can't see, taste, or feel. How can you even begin with a science of mind if you're meant to be researching things that you can see, measure, and manipulate? Well, the answer is dominating psychology in the mid-20th century, which simply stopped talking about mental contents. This is the behaviorism school, which dominated American psychology until the early 1950s, when a group of Harvard-affiliated scientists began to reconsider the fundamental premise that when we talk about how computers operate, we can't avoid computing interior states to them. Computers have memory, goal states, and execute plans, and if you can do that about a piece of metal without being unscientific, why should you be on the scientific side of things to say those things about a human person?
Cognitive science combined experimental psychology, in which people study other humans in the lab, with linguistics, which included the famous theories of linguist Noam Chomsky, who was a society fellow at Harvard at the time, as well as computer science and artificial intelligence, and later neuroscience. I'm Steve Pinker, and I'm a Harvard College professor and Johnston family professor in the psychology department. The Harvard Cognitive Revolution marked the beginning of contemporary scientific study of the mind. You can't see them, you can't taste them, and you can't feel them if you study something like the mind. If you pretend to be a scientist, you'll be confronted with the immediate problem of what we do with these things called mental contents, thoughts, emotions, images, plans, and rules, which you can't see, taste, or feel. How can you even begin with a science of mind if you're meant to be researching things that you can see, measure, and manipulate? Well, the answer is dominating psychology in the mid-20th century, which simply stopped talking about mental contents. This is the behaviorism school, which dominated American psychology until the early 1950s, when a group of Harvard-affiliated scientists began to reconsider the fundamental premise that when we talk about how computers operate, we can't avoid computing interior states to them. Computers have memory, goal states, and execute plans, and if you can do that about a piece of metal without being unscientific, why should you be on the scientific side of things to say those things about a human person? Cognitive science combined experimental psychology, in which people study other humans in the lab, with linguistics, which included the famous theories of linguist Noam Chomsky, who was a society fellow at Harvard at the time, as well as computer science and artificial intelligence, and later neuroscience. Alzheimer's disease is a kind of dementia that begins with modest memory loss and progresses to the point where it interferes with a patient's everyday activities. It has a significant impact on the patient's memory, thinking, and behavior. Though Alzheimer's disease primarily affects persons over the age of 65, it is not merely a disease of old age. Younger people, up to 5% of those with the condition, are also at risk. According to the disease's cause, a clump of proteins forms in the brain, which damages the patient's brain cells at first but eventually kills them, causing particular sections of the brain to atrophy and the patient's memory to deteriorate. Patients with Alzheimer's disease have a life expectancy of 4 to 20 years, depending on their age and other health issues. With no cure in sight, current Alzheimer's treatment can only help to alleviate symptoms and enhance the patient's quality of life. Alzheimer's disease is a kind of dementia that begins with modest memory loss and progresses to the point where it interferes with a patient's everyday activities. It has a significant impact on the patient's memory, thinking, and behavior. Though Alzheimer's disease primarily affects persons over the age of 65, it is not merely a disease of old age. Younger people, up to 5% of those with the condition, are also at risk. According to the disease's cause, a clump of proteins forms in the brain, which damages the patient's brain cells at first but eventually kills them, causing particular sections of the brain to atrophy and the patient's memory to deteriorate. <laughs> 
Patients with Alzheimer's disease have a life expectancy of 4 to 20 years, depending on their age and other health issues. With no cure in sight, current Alzheimer's treatment can only help to alleviate symptoms and enhance the patient's quality of life. We're going to start today talking about congressional aides, that is, the people who work for our congressional representatives, both in Washington and in the representatives' local districts. It used to be that members of Congress had a relatively small staff of people working for them, and the role of these people wasn't of primary importance. But now there are thousands of congressional aides, and they've profoundly affected the way the whole government works. Congressional aides work in two different locations, one, in the congressional representatives' local offices, the districts from which they were elected, and two, in Washington. Staff in the local offices help members of Congress stay in touch with citizens in their districts. These citizens can bring problems in in person, or by mail or phone. This personal connection between the aides and the local people can be helpful when the next election comes around. People remember the help they get from the office of their local congressional representative. But as you know, members of Congress have to spend most of their time in Washington taking care of their legislative duties. Over 6,000 new laws are introduced in Congress each session. Without help, representatives would have trouble keeping up with the proposed laws that directly affect their districts. So that's why the congressional aides play a major role in Washington. They keep their bosses informed about pending legislation, organize hearings, and just keep their local congressional representatives up to date and informed on what's going on in other parts of Congress. Now another thing congressional aides do is to help develop ideas for laws that their bosses can eventually propose to Congress. This can be called the staff's entrepreneurial function, a bit like a business executive trying to find out what products are most popular. Congressional aides promote or encourage laws they think will be popular with the public. You've also got other employees that work for the whole Congress, not just for individual members. We'll talk about these people next. We're going to start today talking about congressional aides, that is, the people who work for our congressional representatives, both in Washington and in the representatives' local districts. It used to be that members of Congress had a relatively small staff of people working for them, and the role of these people wasn't of primary importance. But now there are thousands of congressional aides, and they've profoundly affected the way the whole government works. Congressional aides work in two different locations, one, in the congressional representatives' local offices, the districts from which they were elected, and two, in Washington. Staff in the local offices help members of Congress stay in touch with citizens in their districts. These citizens can bring problems in in person, or by mail or phone. This personal connection between the aides and the local people can be helpful when the next election comes around. People remember the help they get from the office of their local congressional representative. But as you know, members of Congress have to spend most of their time in Washington taking care of their legislative duties. Over 6,000 new laws are introduced in Congress each session. Without help, representatives would have trouble keeping up with the proposed laws that directly affect their districts. So that's why the congressional aides play a major role in Washington. They keep their bosses informed about pending legislation, organize hearings, and just keep their local congressional representatives up to date and informed on what's going on in other parts of Congress. Now another thing congressional aides do is to help develop ideas for laws that their bosses can eventually propose to Congress. This can be called the staff's entrepreneurial function, a bit like a business executive trying to find out what products are most popular. Congressional aides promote or encourage laws they think will be popular with the public. You've also got other employees that work for the whole Congress, not just for individual members. We'll talk about these people next. Because certain places are unsuited for growing crops, some of the negative consequences of climate change alter agricultural productivity. 
millions of Africans will be hungry in the future. Climate change will lead to a decrease in agricultural output and food production. A lack of resources makes it harder for poor countries to deal with the effects of climate change. Many people, primarily in Africa, are starving to death. There are dire consequences for the global economy as a result of climate change. The arid and hot conditions of the tropical regions of the earth make them unsuitable for food production at first. Floods and storms are made more frequent and severe as a result of climate change, which puts a strain on the world's food supply. As a result, there is a 10 to 17 percent yearly decrease in the amount of food available. And by 2070, this tendency is expected to continue. Some African countries are expected to bear the brunt of the effects of climate change. Because certain places are unsuited for growing crops, some of the negative consequences of climate change alter agricultural productivity. Millions of Africans will be hungry in the future. Climate change will lead to a decrease in agricultural output and food production. A lack of resources makes it harder for poor countries to deal with the effects of climate change. Many people, primarily in Africa, are starving to death. There are dire consequences for the global economy as a result of climate change. The arid and hot conditions of the tropical regions of the earth make them unsuitable for food production at first. Floods and storms are made more frequent and severe as a result of climate change, which puts a strain on the world's food supply. As a result, there is a 10 to 17 percent yearly decrease in the amount of food available. And by 2070, this tendency is expected to continue. Some African countries are expected to bear the brunt of the effects of climate change. In 1883 Mary Mallon left Ireland aged just 15 to seek her fortunes in America. There she quickly got to work as a cook for New York City's wealthiest families. In the summer of 1906 she was hired by Charles Henry Warren, a wealthy banker with a holiday home in Oyster Bay, Long Island. However, the holiday quickly turned south when six of the eleven members came down with typhoid fever. Victims of typhoid could suffer a fever abdominal cramps, abdominal distension, intestinal hemorrhaging, and in 10% of cases death. The source of infection was water and food contaminated with excrement. Today it's common knowledge to wash your hands after using the bathroom. But back then that really wasn't the case. Immunization wouldn't roll out until 1911 and antibiotic treatment wouldn't become readily available until 1948. By 1907 in the New York area alone, 3,000 people had been diagnosed which you would think would be a massive deal but not yet pleased. It wasn't until the virus hit Oyster Bay where it affected the effluent that it became mainstream news. And so George Sopper was hired by the Warrens to investigate. His search quickly led him to Mary Mallon, her unlikely partner in crime was peached ice cream. The cold dish merely froze copious amounts of bacteria instead of burning them which would have been the case in hot food. As the investigation continued, Sopper began snooping around Mary's employment history. He discovered that of the eight families she'd worked for, seven of them came down with typhoid. Sopper had a theory, maybe she was the first ever documented healthy carrier of Salmonella typhi. With the proof, Mary did not play ball constantly denying soap stole samples. He eventually needed the help of the New York City and even the NYPD. Don't worry she wasn't arrested just held on the desolate island in isolation for two years, North Brothers to be exact. This was a bit of a moral quandary. There was an obligation to Mary's human rights but also the obligation to the general public to keep them infection-free people have been held in quarantine before but only people who had clear signs of sickness. Mary appeared perfectly healthy. Compromises were struck up. Doctors suspected that bacteria were coming from her gallbladder and offered to release if they removed it. Mary refused that deal but did promise she'd never work as a cook again. <laughs> 
Five years later she broke that promise and remained at large until 1915. She infected 25 people at the Sloan Maternity Hospital in Manhattan infecting doctors patients and nurses two of whom died. The NYPD took her back to North Brothers Island, again, where she'd spend the rest of her life. Upon Mary's death some 20 years later, the doctors seized the opportunity to inspect Mary's gallbladder. And what did they find life typhoid bacteria living in her remains? The case of typhoid Mary is a conundrum that still intrigues us today. Was she the villain or was she the victim? Were the authorities right to violate one woman's individual liberties if it meant protecting the general population and could they have done more to educate Mary on the dangers of what she was doing? If you want to see more content like this, please don't forget to like unsubscribe or leave a comment below. In 1883 Mary Mallon left Ireland aged just 15 to seek her fortunes in America. There she quickly got to work as a cook for New York City's wealthiest families. In the summer of 1906 she was hired by Charles Henry Warren, a wealthy banker with a holiday home in Oyster Bay, Long Island. However, the holiday quickly turned south when six of the eleven members came down with typhoid fever. Victims of typhoid could suffer a fever abdominal cramps, abdominal distension, intestinal hemorrhaging, and in 10% of cases death. The source of infection was water and food contaminated with excrement. Today it's common knowledge to wash your hands after using the bathroom. But back then that really wasn't the case. Immunization wouldn't roll out until 1911 and antibiotic treatment wouldn't become readily available until 1948. By 1907 in the New York area alone, 3,000 people had been diagnosed which you would think would be a massive deal but not yet pleased. It wasn't until the virus hit Oyster Bay where it affected the effluent that it became mainstream news. And so George Sopper was hired by the Warrens to investigate. His search quickly led him to Mary Mallon, her unlikely partner in crime was peached ice cream. The cold dish merely froze copious amounts of bacteria instead of burning them which would have been the case in hot food. As the investigation continued, Sopper began snooping around Mary's employment history. He discovered that of the eight families she'd worked for, seven of them came down with typhoid. Sopper had a theory, maybe she was the first ever documented healthy carrier of Salmonella typhi. With the proof, Mary did not play ball constantly denying soap stole samples. He eventually needed the help of the New York City and even the NYPD. Don't worry she wasn't arrested just held on the desolate island in isolation for two years, North Brothers to be exact. This was a bit of a moral quandary. There was an obligation to Mary's human rights but also the obligation to the general public to keep them infection-free people have been held in quarantine before but only people who had clear signs of sickness. Mary appeared perfectly healthy. Compromises were struck up. Doctors suspected that bacteria were coming from her gallbladder and offered to release if they removed it. Mary refused that deal but did promise she'd never work as a cook again. Five years later she broke that promise and remained at large until 1915. She infected 25 people at the Sloan Maternity Hospital in Manhattan infecting doctors patients and nurses two of whom died. The NYPD took her back to North Brothers Island, again, where she'd spend the rest of her life. Upon Mary's death some 20 years later, the doctors seized the opportunity to inspect Mary's gallbladder. And what did they find life typhoid bacteria living in her remains? The case of typhoid Mary is a conundrum that still intrigues us today. Was she the villain or was she the victim? Were the authorities right to violate one woman's individual liberties if it meant protecting the general population and could they have done more to educate Mary on the dangers of what she was doing? If you want to see more content like this, please don't forget to like unsubscribe or leave a comment below.
That's why I'm here today to talk about the conflicts that arise from that. As a society, we should be able to have an informed discussion about the appropriate level of privacy and security without going overboard. To say that privacy is a human right is to cite the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We've been given a slew of safeguards to keep us safe in the real world. That we care about our privacy is well established. We have doors, a window covering, a lock, garments, and shutters to protect our homes. And the privacy that exists in the physical world, in three dimensions, is being eroded by technology. There is a loss of privacy due to security cameras, automated number and plate recognition. As a result of long lens cameras and paparazzi, there is no longer any privacy or distance. In addition, body scanners are increasingly being utilized to look through clothing. New quantum technologies are now capable of detecting gravitational fields, and this development will not slow down. And it's progressing at an incredible pace. You also can't protect yourself from gravity. Quantum physics has already made it possible to look past barriers. Additionally, laser scattered light may be used to view around corners. Privacy is being eroded by technology. That's why I'm here today to talk about the conflicts that arise from that. As a society, we should be able to have an informed discussion about the appropriate level of privacy and security without going overboard. To say that privacy is a human right is to cite the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We've been given a slew of safeguards to keep us safe in the real world. That we care about our privacy is well established. We have doors, a window covering, a lock, garments, and shutters to protect our homes. And the privacy that exists in the physical world, in three dimensions, is being eroded by technology. There is a loss of privacy due to security cameras, automated number and plate recognition. As a result of long lens cameras and paparazzi, there is no longer any privacy or distance. In addition, body scanners are increasingly being utilized to look through clothing. New quantum technologies are now capable of detecting gravitational fields, and this development will not slow down. And it's progressing at an incredible pace. You also can't protect yourself from gravity. Quantum physics has already made it possible to look past barriers. Additionally, laser scattered light may be used to view around corners. Privacy is being eroded by technology. In the past several days, you've been reading about the devastating impact earthquakes have on human life. That's why seismologists have been working so hard to create earthquake prediction technologies. We can now quite accurately anticipate earthquakes, but the predictions simply point to possible hazard zones. They cannot anticipate the exact timing and location of an earthquake. Today, I'd want to expose you to three different prediction models. Using a first-order prediction model, seismic gaps are sought along fissures in the Earth's crust. For lengthy periods of time, a fault may display no seismic activity at all, which is known as a seismic gap. According to this notion, such locations are about to experience a massive shock. Model 2 relies on natural events, such as ground flies. The ground tilted before large earthquakes were seen using long cylindrical tubes filled with water. Scientists were able to accurately forecast the 1975 Haichang quake, the first successful earthquake prediction they had ever produced. Before the earthquake occurred, a million people were evacuated from that Chinese metropolis. We can't say this strategy has been mastered because it hasn't worked consistently. Based on this hypothesis, the third model proposes that significant earthquakes follow a sequence of smaller ones. Smaller quakes are used to determine the times when the chance of a much larger quake increases. While this system is now unable to forecast particular times and locations, it may become more accurate as it is refined. Right now, none of these models can be relied upon to make accurate predictions.
In the past several days, you've been reading about the devastating impact earthquakes have on human life. That's why seismologists have been working so hard to create earthquake prediction technologies. We can now quite accurately anticipate earthquakes, but the predictions simply point to possible hazard zones. They cannot anticipate the exact timing and location of an earthquake. Today, I'd want to expose you to three different prediction models. Using a first-order prediction model, seismic gaps are sought along fissures in the Earth's crust. For lengthy periods of time, a fault may display no seismic activity at all, which is known as a seismic gap. According to this notion, such locations are about to experience a massive shock. Model 2 relies on natural events, such as ground flies. The ground tilted before large earthquakes were seen using long cylindrical tubes filled with water. Scientists were able to accurately forecast the 1975 Haichen quake, the first successful earthquake prediction they had ever produced. Before the earthquake occurred, a million people were evacuated from that Chinese metropolis. We can't say this strategy has been mastered because it hasn't worked consistently. Based on this hypothesis, the third model proposes that significant earthquakes follow a sequence of smaller ones. Smaller quakes are used to determine the times when the chance of a much larger quake increases. While this system is now unable to forecast particular times and locations, it may become more accurate as it is refined. Right now, none of these models can be relied upon to make accurate predictions.